Okay, everybody. Uh, might as well get started because we'll probably run out of time anyway. So might as well get started now and run out of less time. Um, welcome to the session entitled Building Dapps with Textile and the iCloud for the D-Web. Um, pretty lofty title, but hopefully we will do some of that stuff. Um, okay, so some housekeeping stuff. Uh, and we'll go over like getting the slides and stuff like that. Does, any, does anybody want to have the slides locally handy? Or are we cool with uh, the first part I was kind of going to do some slides and it's more a little less hands on and then the second half will be completely hands on. But if you want to start grabbing uh, the slides and code examples and th things locally right away. Um, first, I am told you should connect to the internet backup uh, for this. We've got one little guy right here in the room. So internet backup C and the password is share with IPFS. Um, that should make it a lot easier to actually download code snippets and slides and all that stuff. Um, so I'll leave this up for a second while I also say welcome to our session. Thank you for coming. Um, yeah, so I'll just leave that for a sec, get logged in. And then um, while you do that, I'm just gonna kinda go over what we're gonna talk about today so that you could discreetly leave if you decide that that's not something you wanna do. Um, so we're gonna introduce you to a bunch of tools and techniques that we, um, the textile team have kind of developed along the way building real world apps on top of IPFS. Um, so we're gonna kind of do it from the perspective of like real world app development. Um, and we're gonna do it from the perspective of a, a simple game of tag that we developed for the IPFS camp. Um, so it's a little game of tag that operates over like lib P2P and IPFS um, in order to kind of get people interacting in a nerdy but fun kind of way. So we'll do a quick demo kind of at the beginning of the tag game. Um, and then uh, we'll do a kind of command line version of it um, to keep things kind of simple in the context of the workshop. Uh, so we're gonna use some textile developer, t developer, developer tools that we've developed. We're gonna go over a bunch of kind of core concepts uh, that we use in the sort of textile ecosystem. Uh, so we'll do things like you know, data schemas, uh, decentralized database kind of structure, a little bit about identity and contacts and um, uh, linking users, and then some more social interactions like messaging, likes, comments, things like that, and how you'd integrate that into a real, a real DAP. So if you want to do that, great. If you don't, I'm going to turn over this way for a second. You can just sneak out the door. I won't feel bad. Um, you do that. So. Let's, I've lost this. Um, okay, so I've already mentioned textile a bunch of times. You've probably seen our sneaky stickers all over the place. Um, so a little <coughs> bit about textile. Textile is a, like an ecosystem of developer tools and a, a, a network that operates within or a part of or on top of uh, an IP, the IPFS network. So we provide encrypted, recoverable, schema-based cross-application <laughs> data storage um, built on top of IPFS and libp2p. And someone recently described it as sort of like a layer two framework on top of uh, IPFS network. So that might be a good way to kind of conceptualize it. Um, so it works on the normal IPFS network. Any data that you use, add, interact with in a textile context is available via normal IPFS gateways and all that stuff. Uh, except that it's probably encrypted um, if you've encrypted it, so it would, might look weir weird if you tried to access it over a gateway. Uh, but in general, that's all doable. Um, so then on top of this sort of sub-network, we've got a bunch of develop developer tools that um, are designed to take advantage of the uh, schemas and things like that that Textile applies to data. And we'll talk quite a bit about that idea of basically like enforcing data schemas on IPFS um, as, as a sort of big example or big piece of the textile um, framework. So that's what we're gonna do. That's kind of uh, what we're doing. Here's a fancy network diagram that um, Sander made for us. 
so half the textile team is here right now. Um, so if something goes wrong, it's the other half of the team's fault, <laughs> not our fault, okay? Uh, so just keep that in mind. Um, while we go through, I'm gonna kinda do the thing here at the computer and then these two guys, uh, Ben and Andrew, will be uh, available if anything goes wrong or you need some help or have a question or something like that, okay? And they might also interject with better versions of the things that I will say. Um, so I'm Carson, I've been t with Textile since the beginning, uh, building various aspects of our um, developer tools. I've written a lot of stuff about IPFS in general, um, and that's that's it. That's it. That's enough about me. Ben, you can go quick. I, yeah, Ben, been with Techstuff for three months now. Uh, so the most recent hire that is now intern, uh, come from the open source world and helping them out with engineering and product. So I'm Andrew. I've been with Textile forever. Uh, yeah, I engineer, talk to people, everything. And then Sander, Aaron, and Thomas are back home. So there we go. Okay. Um, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to kind of go through um, concepts mostly in the first half. We'll take a break. And during that break, I'll get you to install some things. And well, you can also take a break. But then we get back, and we'll kind of get hands on and start playing around on the terminal a little bit. Um, so that's pretty much it. Um, I'm going to assume, you know, all the same things that all the other sessions have assumed that you know what IPFS is and like various things like that. I think that's a pretty safe assumption at this stage. Um, not going to assume that you know like how to do any uh, mobile development or uh, JavaScript or anything like that. Just that you're able to copy and paste things. It's pretty much all you need to be able to do. So uh, I think that's it. Um, here's the structure, but you know whatever. That's fine. So. Uh, We'll do kind of a bit of a demo. Um, Andrew, have, can we, have you got like a, can I just give you this? this thing Sweet, okay. I didn't, I didn't follow the instructions to draw the Wi-Fi that's special for this. Can you pull that slide up? That's right, yeah. Ah, perfect. Yeah. Um, so Andrew's just gonna run the mobile app in a simulator on his laptop so you can kind of see uh, what things, how things are going. And then for the session, we will interact with the same data um, and the same sort of distributed um, database tables, but we'll do it from the command line. Um, so the idea being that you can actually have different apps interacting with the same data, um, but in different contexts. So hopefully. Yeah, cool. So we um, were trying to think about uh, a fun demo to bring uh, so that we could build with all of you. And uh, we came up with this game of tag. We thought it had a lot of really nice properties to talk about decentralized data, shared databases, verification even. And so we started thinking that actually getting everybody spun up on building a mobile app is a really big challenge if you're not already familiar with Xcode or React Native or Swift or something. So what we did is we built the demo app to show you how it works in a mobile phone, but today we're gonna focus on um, just doing the doing it over command line, so you'll learn how the actual pieces are put together. Um, but this is the game of tag in the mobile phone. Some of you already joined a game that was running since yesterday, but I'll just show you really quick. I think I'll have to leave that game on my phone. Um, I built this to be really lightweight, so there's no like there's no searching for other people on it or anything like that. It all happens over QR code, which was a decision because speaking between Android and iOS devices without some prior knowledge of each other is still it's stupid. Um, but a QR code works m most of the time if it works on your phone. So what's gonna happen is, um, just to like foreshadow on things that we're gonna talk about in the workshop part. Um, so you joined the game, uh, and here this user's already joined and they've called themselves the Camp King. Um, and so they have this identity in textile uh, that is essentially, you can think of it like your peer ID plus a little bit of more information, like display name and some other ways to find you. Uh, and so now they have this identity in the mobile app and what they wanna do is they wanna create a new tag game. And so uh, they're gonna create this game here. Can you guys see that all right? It's pretty dark, yeah? I know you can see it okay? All right. What's that? You want that down? Yeah. Uh, oh, that was worse. More, that's even more no. worse. Maybe it's the. Uh, uh, okay, cool. 
You're good. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so yeah, this, this user wants to create a game, and so what we do behind the scenes is we just treat every game like a new database of information you want to share, and we call those threads. So it, it, behind the scenes textile, the, uh, the mobile SDK, is going to create a thread, and here the first thing that this user needs to do is uh, um, create a name, so we'll just call it the demo game. Uh, okay, so now the thread is created. The rest of this is just information that we add to the actual database. So here we want the user to be able to set how long this game should run for. So here they'll just choose that they want to run for an hour. Okay, so now they have this database and they want to get other people into this database. So the databases are uh, encrypted, uh, so they have a key pair. What you need to do is, is exchange some information about how to find that database and how to unlock it. And so uh, we do that all, all in this game just through this QR code. And what happens is on my phone, I can just scan it. And this QR code is using some tricks in mobile. You can do what's called deep linking. So it's a, uh, it's a link that my app knows how to open directly on my phone. So when I, if this scans off the projector, come on, QR code. Give it a tap. You can also do it on the screen. Well. Yeah. So, okay, so it just opens right in the app. And it has some information encoded in here, so it knows it's an invite. So it says, yeah, do I want to invite? So I accept that. And um, yeah, so here, this one now gets some information that has two players. So what happened is I got the information for where this database was, and I went and added a record to it, which we call a join block, which gives all the information about who I am on this phone. Um, so now we have two players in the game. And uh, OK, so then there's rules in the game for how it should be played. It's really funny, like if you want to tag somebody with your phone, like so this is a game of tag, like on the playground. You go around, you tag somebody, they're it. Uh, that's a really, that's a weird thing to do on the phone. So the way that we encoded the rules here is that when the person is it, their phone is going to be red. And anybody who sees the red card has to just be it. And what does it mean to have to be it? They're going to scan that red card and it's going to be transferred. So what we do is we have this verified entry in the database that's a tag. And the way it's verified is the person that's becoming it signs it. With their, with their key. So everybody else playing the game can see that and, know, and can trust it. Like nobody wants to be it, so they just say, yeah, I trust that, that person's now it. Um, so this game's ready to play. Uh, unfortunately, there's a, there's a little block out here. This person's it, and so they're in like the timeout for the first five minutes of being it. Um, and then what's gonna happen is this is gonna turn into that QR code, and maybe we can show you this right before the workshop. If I scan that QR code, that it is gonna be detected on, in the database on my phone. I'm gonna verify it, I'm gonna believe it. And then the phone has a record of everybody that's been it, knows who's currently it, and it will be, it will turn red and play on. So, so that's perfect. Um, so I will transfer the it onto my computer. Um, and then it, I can leave this going here. Uh, for. Okay. Wow, that actually just worked. That's good. Um, it was perfect. Yeah, we don't write any any mistakes in our code. Uh, okay, so so that was pretty cool. I think um, got this little game. So what we're gonna do over the next couple of slides is kind of break down the anatomy of that game. Um, talk about like what exactly tag is and how we implement the various components of tag in say uh, a textile style DAP. Okay. So first of all, like what does it take to build a game of tag on IPFS? We're gonna use decentralized uh, concepts. You know, uh, we're going to have some encryption and verifiable identities and things like that, so that um, you're not just tagging people willy-nilly like some sort of crazy anarchy. So, uh, what is a game of tag? Ultimately, it's a bunch of people who've all presumably agreed on a set of rules for how that game of tag should be played, um, and some shared sort of record or state or understanding of the current gameplay, right? So, or you know, in another context, it'd be a board game of some kind. Um, and then a way to communicate and verify that the rules of the game are being uh, satisfied and played. I mean, ultimately, that's what most games are. So that's what we need. Um, in, in the sort of textile framework, um, we have a couple of core concepts that we'll use to satisfy some of those conditions. So identification, or at least identifying each other, we do via um, something we call data wallets and accounts within those data wallets. And when you do download the slides, these uh, links are links to documentation on our docs website. So you can kind of reference that stuff later. Um, 
And but we'll also talk about these concepts in detail in a second. Uh, so identifying individuals, we've got wallets and we've got accounts. And the accounts are like kind of web to a style accounts. You've got an avatar and a display name and all the good stuff that you would expect. Um, rules are defined via schemas. Basically, rules are defined by rules that, um, that control how data gets added to the database. So schemas very similarly in the way you would think about database schemas more traditionally. Um, and then a shared record or state and uh, communication are done via what we call threads. Threads are essentially um, just distributed database tables. So your you know, IPFS wallet, or sorry, your textile wallet would be like a single database in, a, in that sort of uh, uh, conceptual framework. And then each thread would be a table within that um, database. And you can have a bunch of different threads one per app, you could have multiple threads per app, they're very lightweight, um, and we'll talk about the actual structure of a thread in a little bit. Um, and then obviously you need to interface with the game in some way. Um, in the textile world, we have a bunch of clients. Today we're just gonna play around with the command line client, which is just like a really thin wrapper around uh, an API that is exposed on, your, on the desktop. But we have um, like SDKs for iOS, Android, JavaScript, um, whatever. So each client is, you know, sort of tuned for the environment in which it gets used. Uh, and that's pretty much all you need. So there, that's how you make a game. Easy, right? You just need to know how to do it and then do it correctly. Then that's a game. Um, so games, you know, like this are usually about people. Um, and so uh, the way that we do that in the textile world is we use uh, wallets and accounts, okay? So if you're familiar with sort of Bitcoin concepts, then you might be familiar with the idea of like a, your coin wallet, um, where you would have some sort of recovery phrase. Sometimes it's a mnemonic recovery phrase. BIP39 might be a term you've heard, or BIP32 for a hierarchical data wallet. So we use a hierarchical data wallet to basically allow you to have a, um, a like main key that can be used to derive sub accounts. And we, uh, kind of you can conceptualize accounts, and I'll go into more details as we move along. You can think of accounts like different personas, potentially, right? So I might have, um, you know, I, I'm, I care about storing my personal tag history for some reason uh, long term, but I want to like separate my workplace tag games from my home tag games, obviously. So then I might want to create different accounts with different personas, different avatars, different names, uh, everything that are essentially sandboxed from each other, but can be derived and recreated from a master key. Um, so that if I drop my phone in a mud puddle, as an example that Sandra uses all the time, uh, he's very worried about mud puddles. Um, if I did that, I would still be able to recover all of my data from the network afterwards. Um, so we use these uh, hierarchical de deterministic wallets to derive account keys. And accounts are really just private public keys, just like, or a key pair, just like uh, IPFS peer kind of um, uh, setup. So every account inside of a wallet uh, can be derived from your mnemonic phrase. So you, really all a wallet is, is like 12 words or 16 yeah. words or something like that, however many words you want to have. That's it. Um, and then from that, you can derive these different accounts. Um, so, uh, oops, let's go. Um, um, right, so uh, there's a couple of fun things that we did, like, um, you know, uh, uh, your account address is your public key. It always starts with the P. Uh, your account uh, seed or key is, a pri is your private key. Uh, it always starts with P. Uh, S. I mean, S, sorry, because it's secret. S for secret. Um, and you can... From those um, accounts, you can provision new IPFS peers, right? So each account would have a separate peer that it interacts with. And in fact, you could, you could even create sort of ephemeral peers so that you use a different peer for like every app or um, potentially even every session of every app that you um, wanted if you, if you wanted. Uh, but in practice, it's a lot easier to just sort of associate a single peer with a given account on a, in a given app. Uh, but what this still allows you to do is if I've got, uh, you know, my iOS phone and I've got an Android phone and I want to play tag, you know, on different phones, I could use the same account, but each phone will have a separate peer, uh, which allows me to sort of distinguish between which uh, device is making different updates. But those updates will still get synced across those devices, and we'll talk a little bit about 
how sync works as well um, as we go along. So you can think of a, like a, this is almost like namespacing, right? We've got like one global namespace, which is your mnemonic, and then below that we've got uh, these accounts, and within those accounts we can actually have multiple peers that control that account, right? With me so far? Now, of course, you don't really need to know any of this um, as a user of a sort of textile-based app. All of these things just get allocated automatically, and generally any app is just going to use a default account, and they can uh, assign a peer ID and all that stuff uh, very nicely. And so we'll, we'll kind of go through that today. You'll see that while it's useful to know this stuff, you don't really need to interact with it very much. Um, okay. So that's pretty much all we need to know for now for that. Okay, so then the next thing is, okay, so we've got me, I've allocated myself an account based on an um, identity, and I want to interact with um, the other players of the game who have presumably also got some sort of wallet back account. Um, so we use uh, what are called textile threads, um, and really that's the sort of like basis for what everything else kind of builds um, on top of. So uh, by default, uh, threads are all encrypted, they're recoverable via your account seed. They are all schema-based, um, uh, essentially cross-platform data storage systems. Um, in general, it's, it's useful to think of a thread like a decentralized database uh, of encrypted files and messages shared between the peers that are interacting. Right? So a lot of this is like designed for interacting within a game sense or like uh, textile photos is another example. So these are all peers that are sharing information between them. So they help each other back up that decentralized database. Um, and then as an additional layer on top of um, the, like so, you know, that's like a phone or a, a peer is right here um, and I'm backing up my friend's photos that are, they're sharing with me on my phone. Um, but then there's also an additional layer which are the textile cafes uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about um, later, which provide additional services on top of just regular peers interacting. But we'll talk about that in a second. Um, so essentially these are uh, decentralized databases. Um, so they do provide a bunch of nice services for one another, right? So they provide things like replication, so all the different peers are replicating the current game state in, this, in the sense of a tag game. So who, who is it right now? Uh, all the peers should eventually uh, uh, settle on the same outcome. Uh, they provide P2P updates via libp2p, so like the actual interaction of tagging someone is transferring a tag event as data. Um, that's done via P2P. Uh, they provide conflict resolution, so if I try to tag someone at the same time as someone else tries to tag someone, um, then uh, the players will use a type of CRDT to sort of settle on the actual correct uh, move, which in the game of tag is whoever was actually it gets to tag other people. Obviously, no one else can. Yes? How do you build encryption? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about encryption a bit later uh, because there's a bunch of layers of it. Um, so you've got your account seed, which allows you to do things like sign and verify updates made by other people or other peers. You've also got the, the thread ID is actually a, its public key. And that thread also has a private key. And in order to be allowed to update the thread, you need to have both of those things. And that is a, um, uh, ED25519, I never remember the actual sequence of numbers, one of those uh, key pairs. And then um, when you add files to a thread, each individual file is also individually encrypted. Um, and the key for those files are added to the thread. So really like files in a, a database are really just like their IPFS reference and the key to unlock them. Um, and each of those are individually one-time encrypted with a unique one-time um, key. But encrypted client-side? Yeah, all, yeah, it's all encrypted client-side. Everything just done client-side actually, yeah. There's no sort of centralized uh, framework for doing that. Um, yeah, and we can, we'll talk more about that. If you have questions, we can for sure answer them. Um, yeah, yeah, all the things that databases do, whatever. Uh, queries, uh, access control, right? So you sh if I'm not it, I should not be allowed to 
tag someone who is it. Um, similarly, if I don't have access to the thread because I haven't had the key shared with me, then, well, A, I probably don't even know about the thread and therefore couldn't do anything anyway, but say I had figured it out, I wouldn't be able to do anything because I don't have the shared private key. Um, and then there are some additional controls in there, um, uh, so like a whitelist to, um, so that you can ban particular peers and things like that if you're a member of the thread. Um, so this is a sort of like representation of threads because threads are kind of the most important thing in this framework, which is um, how we interact with uh, all the data. So threads provide essentially a framework for doing, um, you know, uh, storage. Okay, so first the threads are backed by a local SQLite in a, in this current implementation, but the actual database backend is uh, sort of backend agnostic. Um, but by default, it's an SQLite database to uh, provide local replication. And um, that's stored on the local device. And then all the IPFS data is stored in the local IPFS peer. Uh, but then it also provides remote storage via sync with other peers. Uh, it provides recovery via sync with other peers uh, as long as you have your um, key, obviously. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about the UX around that as well. Um, it provides a framework for retrieving data so that if uh, I'm on a, my phone peer and I add a new file or a new tag event, um, I can retrieve that tag event um, off of IPFS on a different peer somewhere else. Um, and then it provides a means to actually update my, um, my peers within my thread um, via sending uh, P2P messages, uh, getting P2P messages, and leaving uh, messages in an inbox framework. So one of our key targets with uh, building textile stuff is running on mobile devices. And if you're playing a game on a mobile device, you're probably going to kind of open it up and add a photo, and then you're going to do this. And so I just had like five seconds of sort of network access for an IPFS peer to try and like maybe add the photo to IPFS and inform all of my peers that something had happened, and maybe look for updates at the same time, uh, which is kind of a hard thing to do. So we've spent a lot of time essentially tweaking how the network requests on mobile uh, optimizes the sort of time it has available, and then tries to get out of the way so that it's not killing your battery and um, network traffic and all that stuff. And we run a little bit in the background as long as the OS will allow. Um, on an Apple device, that's like a very little actual time, um, so basically, our job is that we fight against the operating system so you don't have to. Um, but that's the kind of thing that you're dealing with when you're dealing it in, with it in a mobile environment. So chances are, if I'm playing a game of tag with Andrew, my phone is never on, or at least never on IPFS, at the same time as Andrew's phone. It's probably, you know, quite possibly never. So there needs to be some way that I can leave messages for Andrew, um, and he can then retrieve them when he's online. And that's what we provide, uh, or that's what cafes are for. And anyone can run a cafe. A cafe is essentially just a normal textile peer that provides a few additional services to the general network. Um, so it's basically like just running a vanilla IPFS node, um, except it's doing a couple of nice things for um, the textile network in general. Uh, and one of those nice, th nice things is offline inboxing. So essentially, uh, my, I can register with a cafe on my mobile device, and as a developer, I could maybe spin up my own set of cafes and have my users register with my cafes. Um, and then uh, they could do like offline inboxing and things like that. But any peer can do it. I mean, the incentive layer there is sometimes uh, more complicated. But if you're an app developer, your incentive is my users want to keep their data. Yes? So you keep those cafes as app developer for, for example, running a, um, a SaaS service on top of it. Um, for the user, it's not signing up with a new cafe. Well, not necessarily. They can use their old, they can use their old identity that they already have. But they would, it would be the experience of downloading an app on your iPhone, signing up with iCloud account, um, and this app then cares for all of the data and transmission while you're offline. Uh, yeah, basically. So the really important thing for us is that you, the user should never really be locked into a particular cafe. Um, 
And so the cafes all have to provide like a, a specific API um, so that they're you know transferable. If they don't, then they're not a cafe. But um, so we just added to Textile Photos an interface where you can actually like add and remove different cafes if you want. So in theory, you could say like, okay, well I'll download Textile Photos and I'll use Textile's cafes until I decided like now I want to share like really private data that I just don't trust Textile to take care of anymore. Well, I'll run my own cafe and I'll transfer to that cafe and all my offline messaging and all my backup and stuff will happen over there instead. Yeah. So in theory, you're, you, like if you're a developer, you can hide all that from your user if you don't think that they want that, but you can also expose it to them. Um, and you, you know, the, the, I think our idea of a sort of like the right way to do it is for your power users, you should expose the ability to take and, and move data with you. But um, you know, a nice onboarding experience is also important. Yes. Um, is the API for the cafe going to be formalized into so that there could be other implementations of it? Yeah, um, so uh, right now we're still kind of like settling on it, but it, it actually can, most of the API, I and mean possibly all of it now, can be implemented as lib, lib P2P services. So um, in that sense it can be like, we can have a nice spec and you can implement, like as long as you can implement a lib P2P service, you should be able to provide the cafe services that you need. Yeah. You have another um, question? Yeah, so then you could, even though um, an app might not expose the ability to transfer to another cafe, it kind of, um, another app can use the IPFS node anyway, right? So yeah. yeah. they can do some adversarial interoperability in that case um, without the original app developer making it apparent to the user that it's possible. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, as a bit of an aside, you know, part of the work that we want to do is provide just a generic, like, textile wallet style app that a user could use so they could use that, like, very generic app to change cafes and things like that kind of under the hood of any other apps that are using the framework. Yeah, so like a, like a, like a power user might have a textile wallet app to make those sort of changes, yeah. Um, and now, in some contexts, you know, like if you're if you've got some I don't know if you're you know you're a developer and you've got some proprietary services that you want to provide to your users, and if they switch cafes now suddenly they don't get those like that's a possibility. But at least they can take their data with them wherever they want, and that's a big kind of important thing. Um, yes. What about support for Power Uh Well, so this is the thing we've kind of talked with some other folks about. In theory, as long as, so we, we really all we need is a like valid BIP39 mnemonic to derive the, um, your key. So as long as you can do that, you could use that as your like textile uh, key and derive accounts from it. And then, yeah, you could use a like hardware wallet to like reference that stuff. But because, but, it's all, like all the data is off, off chain, right? So like you still have to kind of assume that it's being replicated somewhere on IPFS. Um, so like cold wallet really would just store like, but, yeah, but you could, yes. I mean, so the answer is yes. You could derive your accounts from like a, a hardware wallet, but there's a lot of important like external things that you have to keep in mind. That makes sense? But not yet, we'll need to add it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. we haven't added that. But like, as long as you can, like it, you can use an existing VIP39 mnemonic. Um, I've, you know, I've probably got like 30 different, no, like 300 different textile accounts here because I just keep accidentally deleting things and you know, whatever for testing. Um, so you can always derive them however you want. We also have a JavaScript client to like derive new mnemonics and accounts and things like that too, um, which is kind of nice standalone thing. Anyway, so now you're all experts in textile. That's how it works. Very simple. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's it. Um, all thread data in general is currently locally indexed on whatever device happens to be doing it for sort of faster queries and things like that. Um, 
So in like a textile photos context, if you're sharing photos with your friends and you add a photo, eventually that photo will get replicated across all the people that are involved in that thread, um, which obviously makes sense because they want to be able to see the photos. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some kind of fun optimizations that you can do to make that sharing experience a little bit more um, sort of like snappy, better UI. Um, uh, oh, but then they also do provide access control. So um, uh, a thread is essentially uh, just like a public key, public private key pair that's backed by, uh, so a thread ID is just its public key and a thread uh, like access control is controlled by its private key. Um, and a thread itself is really just an array or perhaps chain of blocks, uh, block updates. Uh, but of course this chain requires no sort of external consensus uh, algorithm because it's just between previously decided trusted peers. So we don't have to worry about uh, any sort of crazy consensus. It's just a blockchain of block updates. Here's a new photo, here's a new tag event, here's a message, et cetera, et cetera. Yes? What about the order of these things if you have two, like let's say you have two devices which you own and then you do some updates on this one device and, and then on this and they are currently not con connected. So how will the order of these things be determined? Yeah, so um, uh, I won't go into too much detail about this, but there are different types of threads. Um, in general, it uses like a CRDT to um, handle uh, eventual consistency. So that's the like easy okay, answer. Um, but there are other frameworks where we use like deterministic merges and um, like time-based uh, hashes to order things as well. Um, but yeah, the sort of long uh, or short answer is magical CRDT. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so there's a bunch of these blocks. They're time-ordered blocks, effectively. Um, it's a hash tree, right? Like it's each new block references its parent block. Um, so the really cool thing there is just like on Git, as long as you have the head, you can retrieve the entire rest of the uh, chain of updates. Um, and that's what makes recovery possible and kind of magical um, because all you really need to do is tell your peers what the head of the uh, current setup is and they can recover the whole thing in theory. Uh, assuming that like all of the files along there are um, accessible off of IPFS. Uh, one of the cool things that we just added is um, that you can actually traverse the entire tree now via links, IPLD DAG links, for those who are, well, we all did the session, so I, can, I know that you're all experts. Uh, so you can traverse the entire tree even, and never get blocked by missing data or something like that. So if for some reason, you know, some, something disastrous happened and your cat photo disappeared, you would still be able to access the earlier kitten photos um, and it wouldn't get in the way. So that's kind of a nice thing that we had recently. Uh, anyway, so each block contains metadata about that block and then obviously the block content so that you can download the actual uh, files. And there are a bunch of different block types, join blocks, leave blocks, data blocks, message blocks, all sorts of different blocks. You want a different block, we'll add it. Um, I think recently we discussed adding uh, like read receipts, which I hate. But yeah, I know it's crazy. Why would you want to prove that read well, receipt? Read receipt. So proof that, uh, like, oh, okay. so a verifiable signed proof that yes, I received this uh, okay. piece of data, um, which is kind of a neat concept. But uh, anyway, I want to be able to deny that I got someone's photo if I have to. You know, it's never know. Uh, anyway, so all of these different uh, block types will allow your peer to react in certain ways. Um, but the main ones are joins and data, probably. Uh, data blocks are sort of like actual uh, files added to the database. Um, and then, yes, it's locally indexed. And that local index is exposed via um, APIs and uh, various SDKs so that you can do quick queries and things like that. Yes? The index would be low. Yes, exactly. So um, we're running short on time um, for like going through all the thread stuff because I want to make sure we have time to actually get, get our hands dirty and play around with stuff. Um, but this is a sort of like schematic of how that works. And um, essentially, threads are, um, are driven by the schema that defines their structure. 
And basically, a schema is just a declarative, like JSON declarative document, or even it's, it's just a like DAG even, that describes what the eventual DAG added to IPFS should look like. So in this case, this is what we use for um, textile photos. Um, so in this case, you added two photos at the same time, photo zero and photo one. And the schema, which I'm going to show to you in a second, defined how the data added to IPFS should be processed and then added to IPFS and then indexed in the database. So in this case, what the schema defines is you take a photo, you resample it to a fairly large size, you resample it to a fairly small size, a thumb base size, and then we also extract EXIF data uh, and various other things, and then it gets added um, to IPFS, it gets encrypted, added to IPFS, and um, all of these things are uh, encrypted uh, and added. So that's why it says second texture. So you've got like the content for the thumbnail and its metadata, content for the small file and its metadata. What this allows you to do is things like, okay, I've added a bunch of files to IPFS, but I could separately, and the schemas allows you to do this too, pin some things but not others. So for instance, I'm always gonna pin and send right away the thumbnail so that my users get a sort of thumbnail that there's a photo added right away, but they'll only opportunistically download the actual full resolution image so that um, it's not killing their bandwidth if they're uh, not available. And so you can actually kind of optimize how you uh, push data out to users that way. Um, you can also optimize what they keep longer term on the phone. So for instance, if they, um, and we don't do very regular garbage cleanup, but for, for in theory you could pin you could set it up to just pin the thumbnail, so they'll always have the thumbnail, but if they've never kind of scrolled back in time to look at the like high resolution photo in a thread, it'll eventually get garbage cleaned up off the phone and they won't uh, bother reading it. But if they scroll back there, this would be client side code, you could say, oh, now we need to like go fetch it off of IPFS again. So there's a couple kind of nice uh, uh, features like that. Uh, okay, so rules, schemas, that's where that comes in. So schemas do two things. They define the thread DAG structure, and then they define the order of operations or transformations that are needed to actually achieve that structure. So the reason it has, the reason we kind of use this DAG structure is because you can't like make it so that you want to derive the thumbnail from the large file which needed to be derived from the thumbnail or something crazy like that, right? So it has to be a directed graph of operations. And then we use a, a kind of cool sorting algorithm to make sure that you do things in the right order um, in order to produce the output that you want. Um, and I, I'm happy to go into that uh, in more detail, but it's not really very important for the purposes of today's session. Uh, so this is what a schema looks like. This is the one we use for textile photos. Um, so it's called, we, it's a media, we called it media. Um, at the top level, we set pin equal to true. So in this case, you're going to try and just pin everything because we've decided it's important to have all the photos. Um, but then within that DAG structure, you've got a set of links, a large one, which is going to use this special thing that says you can use the raw file, the raw input file. You're going to resize it to a width of 800 pixels and 80% uh, uh, JPEG quality. Um, and so on and so forth for the small one. So the small one, you're also going to refer to the original file. You're going to resize it to a different thing. Um, but to calculate the thumbnail, you're going to refer to the large uh, element. So now this is like a pretty simple, sort of reasonably flat um, uh, structure. But you can actually do pretty cool, like deeply nested dependencies and things like that. Um, and right now, uh, and so that, that's getting more and more complicated as we kind of flush out uh, schema implementations. But it's, it's pretty neat so that you can derive like metadata from a resized file that was resized from the original. You can all do all sorts of fun things like that, including working with JSON, JSON data. So you can process JSON data to keep only certain keys or things like that. Um, and MILS, is the last thing I'll talk about before we kind of take a break. Um, MILs essentially provide like decentralized client-side 
or a remote side compute framework. So they kind of are designed for three things, uh, to validate input. So in the context of like textile photos, they validate that it's in fact a photo coming in and that they're able to resize it and then able to produce a photo output from it. Um, they provide transformations, so the act like resizing or calculating EXIF uh, data, et cetera. And then you can also define how the data gets indexed locally. Um, and there's a lot going on here, uh, way like out of the scope of a uh, you know, 60 minute session. Um, but I, well, at the end I'll refer you to the docs and then you can ask us all sorts of questions about this as well. But yeah, we better take a break. Um, so like take five minutes. Um, in the meantime, I'm gonna put up the install instructions so we can get started on that and then we'll do some hands-on stuff. What time do we have to stop? Okay, so for, for people who are back already, um, you're gonna want to uh, grab, um, let's hold on a second. I'll give you the web, the, um, so pretty much everyone's set up with a Go text style. Oh, no way, really? Yeah, that's what I've been doing. <laughs> Sweet. Right. That's much more organized than I was expecting. Excellent. Okay. Uh, so how many people already have, or are at least part of a group, that have someone has Go text style, the binary downloaded? Dang, guys, that's pretty good. Way more than I was expecting. Excellent. Uh, okay. So uh, the other thing you can do if you want to play around with some of the examples is like clone or otherwise download uh, our little IPFS repo. So github.com textile IPFS camp 2019. I'm assuming there'll be other camps in other years. So go with 2019. Um, so you could grab, you can, you know, get clone that or download the zip file is sufficient as well. Because uh, I won't accept any pull requests. Um, and that's also the slide deck that was. Yeah, the slide deck is in there, which you could copy and paste from. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I'll leave that up there for a second. And then um, once everybody feels kind of comfortable having downloaded it, um, you don't actually need, need any of this stuff to follow along if you don't mind typing a little bit. Uh, and I promise there are no multi-line commands at all. But some of those lines are very long. So, you know. <laughs> uh, okay. So, um, yeah, I don't know like how you wanna, it's probably easier to break it up into little groups of three or four or something like that, but if you wanna do it on your own, that's fine too. Um, and then all we need is the Go textile binary command line tool that you've hopefully already downloaded. Uh, there are some other things in the workshop folder that we could play around with at the end if there's some time. Uh, but we probably won't run out of time. Uh, so, you know, get the latest release, download the binary, install it. There's a little install shell script in there that basically just moves it into your path. Or you can just call out to it directly if you want. Um, and if you're on Windows, it, sh it should also work. Um, and then, yeah. Okay, so we're cool with that. Everybody has the infrastructure needed to do this, hopefully. Now let's see if the internet works. So, first things first, open up a terminal, command line, whatever you want to call it, uh, bash session, you know, whatever. Uh, and you can type or copy and paste textile wallet create. And you will create a textile wallet. Um, and you should get some output that looks a little bit like this. Uh, and it will, by default, print out the sort of account zero, the default account. And what it will print out is your um, account address and your secret key or seed. If that doesn't happen, tell me. Textile wallet uh, create. So all this is doing is it's not saving or writing anything anywhere. It's just printing something onto the, out onto the screen, right? Because basically all a wallet is is the mnemonic. And so there'll be a bunch of words up here. So uh, if you're a developer, you would then provide some way for your user maybe to copy that or back that up somewhere. But since we're just kind of fiddling on the command line, you know, 
you can copy and paste it somewhere else. Or we're just going to use the first account, so you don't even need to save it. Um, you can just treat it as an ephemeral wallet. Okay? Cool that? All right. Then you're going to initialize a textile uh, account. Just like, it's very similar to like IPFS. I mean, you'll notice a lot of these commands are very similar to their IPFS equivalent. So in this case, you're going to call textile in it, and you have to give it a key. So that's the, the sort of long string that started with an S that you just printed in the last uh, uh, command. And what this is going to do is it's going to provision a new textile peer, which has a, an account address and associated uh, secret key. It's going to also provision an IPFS peer automatically, um, and like an IPFS repo and blah, 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 all that stuff. You can control the IPFS repo in pretty much all the same ways that you could control a normal IPFS repo. Um, we've added a few things to like, you'll automatically bootstrap off of peers that we control, um, but you can change that, obviously. Um, we use like default IPFS ports, you can change those. Blah, blah, blah. And of course, it's just a, it's a vanilla IPFS peer, so you can also edit the IPFS config any way that you f see fit as well. You can run this on a private network if you want. All the same stuff that you would normally do with IPFS, you still have access to that here. Yes? If I run this on the server, does that make it a cafe or? Uh, good question. If you run textile in it, dash, dash, cafe mode or something like that, which okay. uh, we'll talk about later, then yes, it would run as a cafe. Because uh, that just turns on some of those IPFS uh, services. Excellent. Yeah. Yes? Can you point it to an existing standalone IPFS daemon? Like you have like IPFS desktop control? Could you? Uh, I've, I've played around with that, and it kind of does work. But there's a few assumptions that we make um, about how the repo is configured that you would have to satisfy. Um, and like by default, we turn off access to the a to the IPFS API from outside of Textile. So there's a few things like that. But yes, in theory, you could use a different one. We're almost out of time, so this, uh, we'll skip that. And what we will do is we're just going to make a very simple default thread um, using our account. Okay, so does everybody in initialize an account? Okay, cool. So Threads can have these schemas. The most simplest schema that we have is the blob schema, and this is the entire definition <coughs> of the blob schema. Its name is blob. You could call that whatever you want. Uh, you're going to pin everything, and you're just going to like send the data through untouched as a like binary blob. It's the probably the least useful schema because it's making no assumptions about structure or what the DAG structure is. It's just putting the blobs of data onto IPFS. Uh, so this is basically like just using IPFS normally, uh, and I'll show you. Oops, I'll show you a more um, complicated one. Uh, well, we'll see if we get to it. Um, anyway, so we can create a thread by going textile threads add. You want might as well give it a nice name, uh, better than name. Um, and then we have a few default schemas. One of them is blob, so you could just do minus minus blob. Um, you can give it a, like a, a unique key if you're an app developer and you're developing multiple different apps and you want to be able to interact with threads between those, you might give it a, a special key so that you could reference it. Um, and then what that will do is blast out a bunch of JSON, which describes the uh, metadata for that thread. Yeah. And it'll look something kind of like this. Uh, but of course, it'll have a unique, um, a unique ID. Everybody's ID will be different because it's a unique uh, private key, public key pair. Um, and there you go. So now you've created a thread. Uh, so you might as well start to add some data to it. So in this case, I'm just going to echo mm, bytes to the terminal and then pipe that into your thread. So now what you you know just to for for fun, you can copy the thread ID of the thread that you just created, and you can pipe mm bytes into the thread as some data. So in that case, you just type textile files add, you copy and paste the thread ID, hit enter, and it will just pipe some string into there, 
untouched um, and not that, not that exciting. And then what you get back is the block update. So this is the sort of like JSON representation of the block that was added to the um, hash tree. And you get like the block ID, its target, which will probably be the same thing, when it was added, the user that, um, uh, so the peer ID that actually added that data, plus a bunch of other uh, information about the file structure. And so uh, in this case, we use the blob. So it's just going to create a single file DAG um, with some metadata, including which mill it was used to process it, a checksum of the files to help with deduplication when you're indexing things, and a bunch of other useful uh, metadata. And uh, that's about it. And but you'll, what you'll notice is at the bottom, there's, there's uh, some empty arrays for comments, um, likes, and the threads that it's a part of. So what you, what you can actually do um, is you could actually add this file to multiple threads, and it would just deduplicate, it would just add a reference, the same reference to the file to multiple threads. So you're not adding more data to the database. And you can actually like comment and like on individual uh, thread files um, and comments are really just like messages that point at a particular. Uh, we also have a few control. open tickets for these sorts of requirements from other apps, so like ideas of tags and other things to support there. So if you're interested in that stuff, jump in our GitHub. Yeah, if you want other things, so like we we've been wrestling or kind of going with the idea of like a flag, a flag block update to sort of flag inappropriate content or flag something you like or like these types of things. Um, for app developers. And what's also nifty here is this metadata is its own IPFS content, and then the data that we're actually storing this mm, bytes is it's also its own IPFS content. So it's useful for deduplication here, if, but we're also encrypting things. So the metadata isn't going to change the hash of the content. Right, yes. Yeah. 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 So the content itself is on IPFS as itself, plus its, its metadata is there. Um, and then the top level DAG links those two things together. And that's what the target is called. Yes? How do you intend to balance really customizable metadata with data that's too much? Uh, how are we going to? You mentioned earlier that if there's other metadata you'd like to add, talk to us and we might add it. So if you have lots of people adding custom metadata. Uh, oh, there's, yeah. Th so there's actually a totally arbitrary metadata entry so you have the data of a file, and then you have the, or sorry, you have the content of the file, yep. and then you have the metadata of the file, and so that's yours to do whatever you want. We have these high-level ones for just some very top generic things, tags, likes, whatever. Um, but yeah, your metadata is yours. Yeah, sorry, it wasn't clear about that. Uh, and then obviously it's your responsibility to manage the schema for your metadata. Um, okay, so we've added some data. We're pretty much out of time. Uh, but there's a bunch of other nice things that you can do from the command line, which I encourage you to explore. We, ten yeah. we still got 10 minutes? Can yeah. we do the end? Can we get through invites? Sweet. Okay. Uh, yes. All right. So first off, I'm going to get this running here. And then why, you can all have me, um, I'll join your, your threads if you'd like. Or you can join my thread. Yeah. Um, so let me just... Just go back to the previous slide, Carlson, and I'll kind of iterate it up there for you. So I'll work. Yep. Scroll down a little bit. Uh, no, we'll go, we'll just right. jump straight to yep. uh, creating. Right. Um, yeah. So what you can do, yeah, go ahead. They can invite, and I'll run this. All right. Um, All right. Do I need the uh, the repo to grab that? Uh, hold on. Right. So using that that ID? No, it stops. It doesn't. Oh no! Did it cut it off? But they're not gonna type that up. That's yeah, in the. Yeah, no, that's in the. <laughs> that's in the repo. <laughs> Type out this 32, <laughs> 42 <laughs> character string. It's case sensitive. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it, this is available on the slides. If you downloaded the uh, repo, you should just be able to copy it. 
Yeah. It's in the facility in the repo. Yeah. Oh. yeah. And we'd have yeah. to get to the repo to get the paste bin. Yeah. So. <laughs> also. Look for use. Yeah. It's in the repo. The use may that is not right idea, right? Yeah. So, so if you, you have to be in the same. Network. Well, they would have already. Yeah. Uh, no. It should just work across. Uh, but chances are, if we're not on the same network today, it might not uh, work. Yeah. It actually. Different. Yeah. That's true. So that's which true. one are you on? You're on the main one. Are you? Uh, I'm on the main one. Okay. <laughs> Must have jumped. I can just quickly switch. Uh, okay, uh, so what you could do is you could invite your literal neighbor to a thread uh, if you'd like, like actually the person sitting next to you. And you could, I don't know, you could create a peer pad. Normally as an application developer, you'd have an alternative channel to transfer uh, peer IDs. Um, but you could invite your neighbor or you could invite me and then you, I would be your neighbor. Um, and you can just copy and paste. That's this Mac right here. Uh, that's the peer ID. You can invite me to a thread um, yeah. and interact with it. But hold on, I gotta, I gotta join this network. Wait, 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 just take a minute. Just one moment. So I do text on threads again. Oh, there was more. Yeah. However, but you're much better off just like copying and pasting it from the slide. Yeah, I think I'll just do that. Yeah. Or do peer pad if you create, yeah. a, I can create a peer pad thing. Uh, but anyway. And put, put the peer pad under the right. Uh, wait, that's his ID? Oh, no, that's the okay. one. I don't know what it is. Oh, yeah. So, you got that's the same one. Though. What's that? You should create a that is my. Yeah. 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 That is my. Neighbor peer ID? Yeah. Yeah. So, then what do people want to put for this thread ID? Thread? Uh, the, yeah, they're going to invite me, so you would put your own thread ID. Yeah. Um, so you have to, you're just creating the invite, not the thread. Okay. It wasn't part of the thing, so I don't know how to tell you. Here we go. All right. So that is the one thing that's important. Now, I've got, I'm just running a little bash script, so if you do successfully invite me to your thread, I will, I will automatically send you an invite to a thread as well, so just to kind of show. Yeah. 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 Yes. So this is textile invite create. Not you're not creating a thread here. You should already have a thread. So no, just, use, just use the thread no, that no, you guys just created. And you're creating an invite, so you you run that. And who who creates the invite? The person who has the thread yeah. or the person who receives the thread? The person, person who has the thread. Yeah. So you would create the invite and say like, hey. Here, why don't you join my thread? I need your peer ID. So you're going to take the thread you well, just you created me to your uh, oh, and what's, invite what's me the, to What's the peer ID? I don't understand what it is. Uh, that's just... You can do textile get profile and see your own yeah. peer ID. But, or you just copy and paste it. And then, yeah. Um, textile what? Profile? If you do textile, oh sorry, textile profile get. Oh, is that my, my public key? Yeah, that's your public key. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so, but for this example, invite Carson to your thread, um, and then what's going to happen is he has a little listener for invites, and he's going to auto invite you to one of his threads. So you know what? I, I think I pasted the wrong peer ID though. Uh, that makes sense. <laughs> is it, are you getting some timeout errors? I'm getting okay. contact, can't find contact. Why don't, uh, why don't you update the? Readers? I'm gonna yeah. very so quickly update it. I uh, think I deleted that. Oh, you blasted your wallet. I blasted my wallet. That's hilarious. No, that's that one. Do you have it? Oh, you could use mine. Um, I don't know what mine is. What was it called? Test of profile? Uh, yep, text of profile, yeah. But then I don't know if I can use Yeah, yeah. No, they have to be this pure pad link right there. Yeah, yeah, if you want. Thread is not shareable. We're getting thread is not shareable. Oh. Um, you have too much. The, yeah, that's the okay. copy paste was too many permissions. Uh, if you didn't copy and paste the extra, you probably get, you probably, probably got cut off. Slide. Yeah. So by default, this okay. Is Great. This is a learning experience. <laughs> by default, when you create a thread, it is okay. like fairly tight permissions. Okay. So only the person who created the thread can write to it. If you want to make it writable and invitable by other peers, you have to. Set sharing to like invite, oh, invite only. Written. I'll show you an example on yeah, the slides. Okay, so it's, it's just that you know, text ID right there. Nobody will. So he's gonna fix that real quick. Uh, 
Yeah, but only don't see my the two eyes yeah, separated. Yeah, 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 one second. Yeah, one second. As he says, yeah, yeah. 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 and then you'll invite him to your yeah. gen, generalize the yeah. and then he will invite you to his. But at the yeah. moment, that's the boss. Yeah, I'm, that's my, my bad. Okay, okay. No, that's all right. Okay. I'll try it. Yeah, uh, but I wanted to show these. Yeah. So that so that ID is updated now. If you refresh. Well, you'll have to look it up on GitHub. Here. So here's a here's an example where it got cut off. Yes. But there's. Oh, type equals open. Oh, I, I need. Mean, like, oh, it's type equals open. Yeah. Or is public good? Uh, so public means that it's publicly. I mean, it's all public. But public means that it's um, publicly viewable, but it's not publicly right now. 